Hello everybody, I start today's video somewhere a little bit different for me. This is Podium Place, and it's a shrine to two things. The first off being coffee, which I know next to nothing about. This one I think is smoky bacon, that is cheese and onion, and um, this, whatever it is, I, I think is salt and vinegar. But beyond that, I am absolutely clueless. Why am I here then? Well, as you may have guessed, the other half of this business is something I am a lot more familiar with. That's cars. Now, a lot of people think that for all of these videos, I have a script to memorize, but that's not actually the case. The only time I ever write anything down is for these bits when I'm stood next to the car, reeling off facts and figures. But I haven't even bothered to do one of those today for reasons which will soon become obvious. The issue with doing this is though sometimes it delivers a more spontaneous and interesting performance, on occasion I am prone to the odd blunder, including repeating things a few too many times. Favourites include stuff like the word however, or the phrase this is a car I've been dying to get my hands on for quite some time. I would like to be a walking talking thesaurus and do things a little bit better, but sometimes that's just not possible. However, this is a car I have been dying to get my hands on for quite some time, so let's talk to you about it. There is a very specific reason I am here today, which is that a very good friend of mine, Michael, has a 12C, and he's currently thinking of replacing it. For a very long time, he's lusted after either a 720S, potentially in spider form, or a 675LT. He's driven a 720S Coupe, but never a 675 of any description. We talk a lot about cars, as car people do, and generally I've driven cars that he's interested in, but not this. So, being the selfless type that I am, I offered to go out, find an LT, and drive it on his behalf to see if it was worth investigating further. I'm that sort of generous, kind soul. Please, no weeping. In the words of Michael Ironside and Starship Troopers, I'd expect you to do the same for me. So, the reason I haven't memorized many facts and figures for this car is because they're entirely irrelevant. That's not what we're talking about today. If you want to know them, go on the internet and it will tell you. Power, loads, the clues in the name by the way. Torque, loads, aero, more, brakes, bigger, splitters, bigger, styling, bolder. This car is incredible also very expensive. Your common or garden variety 675LT is already a mighty thing and not exactly cheap, though it is a lot less money than a 458 Speciale at some quarter of a million pounds versus sort of 300 plus for the Ferrari. This one though is not cheap. The carbon edition is a one of 25 car, they only made some thousand 675s overall, and this particular one we believe is the only one of its kind left in the UK. There were some five here, I think, and I don't believe any others still remaining, are blue tinted. I saw it up for sale at Alistair Bowles a few years ago, and all of my friends agreed this was by far the best looking McLaren we'd ever seen. So I'm gonna try very, very hard not to scratch it on account of the fact it looks very, very expensive if I do. But I digress. Why is it that I've been so deliberately lazy when it comes to researching all the facts and figures about this car? Something I normally care quite a bit about. Well, that's simple. This is certainly a much faster car than the 12C. In fact, the rumor was at the time, given the right conditions and time of day and track, it was just about as quick as the P1 hypercar. However, speed isn't really a problem even in the 12C or a 540C. They're already seriously quick cars. You see, speed is not the problem. The 12C is already a ludicrously fast car, and a couple of weeks ago, I swapped that for the 430 Scuderia for a weekend, and Michael greatly enjoyed the Ferrari, despite the fact it was a slower car. What he enjoyed was the interactivity of it, the excitement and the drama. He's hoping that this will be able to give him all of the stuff he loves about the 12C, the ride comfort, the great storage space, the fact you can take it on long journeys very easily, but with a little bit of that added drama that the Ferrari has and the McLaren was criticized for lacking on launch. Everything I've read up until now tells me that's exactly what this car's gonna give me. But on unfamiliar roads where I'm gonna be taking this fairly easy, is the 675LT still special enough to give me that fizz that I get from something like the 430 Scuderia? And is it good enough to justify the 150,000 pounds extra you'll need to pay to turn a 12C into one of these, bearing in mind that large parts of the two cars are the same? Chassis is identical, engine is essentially the same thing, just tuned differently here, and the suspension in basic form is also the same again. Can McLaren really have done that good a job? Let's find out.
So then, the all-important very first impressions, and I have a lot to say. Handy really, because if I didn't, it'd be a rather short and boring video. First things first then, this car looks absolutely sensational. It's very easy to forget, but when this car was made, McLaren Automotive itself was still very much in its infancy. The 12C had landed back in 2011, and as opening shots go, that was rather impressive. It was certainly a fast car, that was never in doubt. However, criticism of it was generally aimed at the fact it lacked a little bit of theatre. You could tell that McLaren hadn't really taken that into account when all their press releases said, well, we've bought a 455 Eight, we've measured that, we've measured this, and decided ours is better. I think they really believed that all supercar owners cared about was lap times, and though magazines would often have you believe that is the case, it really isn't. The styling was also criticised by some as being equally bland, though I think that's a little harsh, because as time has gone by, I think the 12C has grown into one of McLaren's most accomplished and cohesive designs. If you can say anything about the boys and girls at Woking though, it's that they don't stand still, because just a couple of years after the launch of the 12C, we got the mighty P1, one of the hypercar trinity of the 2010s alongside the Porsche 918 and Ferrari's LaFerrari. Like the 12C, the heart of the P1 was a 3.8-litre twin-turbocharged engine mated to a carbon fibre chassis, though in the P1 it's different to that in the 12C, 650 and 675. The key difference between the two really was that the Super Series was built to always have a convertible version, so the carbon fibre tub didn't have a section going over the passengers, whereas in the P1 it did. That's what they called the carbon fibre mono cage. They did a similar thing with the 720S Coupe. Not much later we got the 650S, which for a brief while McLaren pretended was going to sit alongside the 12C and form something of a model range. However, not really anybody was fooled. The 650 was a lot more car, but not a lot more money, so very soon on McLaren said, yeah, actually, okay, we're not going to do the 12C anymore. Visually, the biggest change for the 650 was the adoption of a P1-style front end, which was dramatically different. However, it was an odd-looking duck if you were already familiar with the 12C, because the rest of the car wasn't really all that different. So it did very much look like a 12C with a P1 front end on, and that's slightly odd. this stuff is important to mention because these are all cars that will be on the radar of anybody currently thinking of one of these. And what this was based on was that 650. However, as you can tell, a lot of work was done so it looks like a much more bespoke thing. And I have to say, visually, it absolutely worked. Though, here is the first of my downsides. I'm not impressed with the interior in this car. It's very, very good. Don't get me wrong, it's an excellent interior in fact. There are some minor changes between the 650-12C and this, the biggest that I can see being the fact that normally here you would have some controls for your HVAC, but that's now been moved over to the centre display here as you'd find in a 570 or a 600 LT. But my problem with so many a 675 is that though the exteriors are often quite wacky, McLaren owners it seems are a little bit braver with their colour choice than Ferrari or Porsche owners, the interiors seem to be almost universal quite dull. I will also be using my 430 Scuderia as a reference and to bring that into the conversation you sit in that car without even turning the key and you know you're in something very very special something very different even if you have an F430 already. This if you sat me in it blindfolded other than the fact it's got these very nice lightweight seats that actually fit me perfectly so they must be the large ones and the HVAC controller has moved Beyond that, I wouldn't actually be able to tell you if this was anything other than a 12C or a 650. I also struggled to imagine the person that was brave enough to say, yeah, I will have that special edition carbon fibre car, and I'll have mine blue tinted please, but uh, yeah, interior, yeah, black Alcantara, yeah, whatever, don't care. It's just not enough, as far as I'm concerned. It needed more. That really is not the fault of McLaren though, that is a specification thing, but as there are so few of these out there, it is worth noting, because most of them that I've seen have been like this. Wild exteriors more often than not, but boring interiors more often than not. I also 
also mentioned earlier that a big part of what I'm trying to do today is not find out what this car's like going hell for leather, because I think we already know it's probably brilliant, but instead, what is it like at normal speeds? What's it really like when you're pootling through town, just driving along normally in traffic as I am now? We actually had a bit of a head start on that, I'll confess, because we've already done our drive-by shots. So myself and my assistant Anthony from the channel Sports & Touring, who's currently over at Podium Place doing a little bit about the rest of the facilities there for our second channel, JM & Friends. If you want to know more about that, check the video. We were filming and um, I would say at normal speeds, barring the fact it's a little firmer and the steering certainly better, more on that in a minute, it isn't night and day different to a 12C. There are certainly changes. You will feel that it's a different car. The gearbox is certainly improved. It's keen to give you a quicker shift at lower speeds, at lower RPMs. In automatic mode, as I am now, it's absolutely fine, very well behaved. I haven't even got the active settings on. One thing to note, by the way, if you do put the active mode on and you engage aero, like so, you kind of lose your rear visibility. That air brake is massive. I believe 50% bigger than on the 650. It looks amazing, but it does also completely obscure your rear view. I wish they'd made a transparent one, TBR Cigaris style. In many ways, I suppose the closeness between this and a 12C or a 650S is actually a very good thing. It's still an incredibly usable car, still very compliant, very comfortable. Even if you stick the handling into sport mode, it's actually very, very nicely damped. McLarens pretty much always have been. Again, as with other cars, the engine doesn't really give you all that much, below about 3,500 RPM, but to pootle about in, it's perfectly good enough, and I could see myself doing big miles in a car like this. It's a shame, really, that very few people do, and this particular example is on just shy of 2,600 miles. That's tragic, though I am incredibly grateful to this car's owner, John, for letting me have a go in it. As I may have mentioned already, he is the man behind Podium Place and clearly loves his cars. But you know something, every now and again the traffic does go away, the roads do clear up a little bit and then you have an opportunity to play. So what's this legendary McLaren really like when you can have a bit of fun? sensational this thing first off the speed of it oh my word I've driven some quick cars some really quick cars and I've owned a few too and I know kind of in my head this should be sort of similar to a 650 which is already a ballistic car but my life it feels like nothing can prepare you for what happens when you put your foot down if those turbos are spinning it's almost irrelevant which gear you're in. This thing is mighty. I know McLaren really were on a mission to try and make this car more exciting, more interesting. And in some ways, they certainly succeeded, though a couple of the things they did are a little contrived. The crack from the exhaust, for one. But I will kind of give them a pass on that because you get just one and only if you're asking for it. So you need to be in sport mode, you need to be over 6,000 RPM, and then you get that. Sometimes, not every time it would appear. There obviously is a formula to get in the crack out of the gearbox. There's one, I haven't worked it out yet. 
It is the same seven-speed seamless shift gearbox you find in pretty much every other McLaren of the time. And here, it's brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Like the 12 seat 650, you have the little panel down here which enables you to engage different driver modes. If you're not familiar with McLarens, to be able to use the settings you've got the car in, you do have to press the active button. For me, the best mode on road is normal handling and sport for the powertrain. One of the big changes, as far as I can see, is actually a very helpful one, something they did in the later cars, such as the 570 and 600. In the 12C and 650, it's not possible to divorce the powertrain and traction control settings. So, if you want the most aggressive powertrain setting, the car will essentially disable traction control. And that you don't really want in a 650 horsepower car all the time. So... <laughs> you've now got the ESC off button hidden within the handling section and that means if you press it once when you've got the car in sport mode you will get reduced ESC hold it and then it will be completely off this is something McLaren should have done from the off my only gripe with it is that in normal handling mode you can't do that it's a frustration but here honestly I'm really not worried the reality is I'm actually going fairly easy on this car a because it's not mine B because it's worth an enormous sum of money probably 450 grand to half a million quid for this exact one and it's on Trofeo tires that are six years old and it's greasy and wet out there this being said the car's doing a surprisingly good job feels much more natural and engaging than in the 12C. In fact, some of the best in any car you're ever likely to experience. If you'd asked me about an hour ago whether you should buy a car like this, I probably would have said no. But now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So then, conclusion time. Should my friend Michael chop in his 12C, get one of these, hold on to that, or do something else? Well, I know he enjoys driving, and driving hard. This is a step on from the 12C in that regard. Though it is an excellent and very capable sports and supercar, I think the 12C actually feels at its best as a GT. A good car for doing big distances in, very comfortable, very competent, but honestly, when it comes to that last edge of dynamic refinement, interactivity, it is just lacking. This fixes all of that. Steering, better and at lower speeds. Gearbox, better and at lower speeds. Engine, uh, maybe not quite the improvement, but it is certainly quicker, if not more tractable low down. It makes, I would say, a better noise, though generally speaking from in here, it sounds like just about every other McLaren up until the Artura. Finding a good spec, I know, is quite difficult. He's also currently toying between the idea of either buying a Spider or a Coupe with the roof scoop. And that, I think, would be a very, very special thing. But for me, a large part of the appeal of a McLaren has been the fact that because of the carbon tub, you can have the spider thing without really any compromise. In fact, you also get a handy bit of storage at the back still, courtesy of the tonneau cover, which when not in use, you can access for storage space. That's genius. It isn't a particularly daunting car to drive, though I am at all times wary of exactly how big that front is. The splitter on this is very pronounced, very aggressive compared to the 12C and the 650, and I do have concerns that it would get caught out very easily. And in the case of this particular car, be extraordinarily expensive to fix. Just ask Shmi if you want to know what it's like to repair tinted carbon. Oh, f yeah, that's that's the kind of thing I'm worried about. As an 
object of desire, I would say, yeah, this is head and shoulders above the 12C. It's gorgeous, looks very much its own thing, and it really works. That rear end treatment really sharpens the car up and I think makes it stand out. It's also rare, it's special, and it gives you all the good stuff about a McLaren with very little of the bad stuff. These allegedly are one of the best built cars they've ever made, and generally speaking, when I talk to people from the McLaren factory, they have nothing but good things to say about the 675. I would, you would therefore think, be all but ready to say, yes, Michael, do it, buy a 675 LT. However, I would not be doing my job if I didn't mention one very large fly in this particular ointment. That's the 650S, because that is a car which in terms of the driving experience gives you nearly all of the upgrades this has. No, maybe not quite as wild, not quite as ballistic, but the steering is improved, the gearbox is improved, it's still comfy, comfier even than this, and I think maybe the 12C2. To look at, sure, not quite as pretty, but the difference between a 12C and a 650 is 20 to 30 grand, depending on your spec. The difference between a 12C and this is 170. And in terms of pure, are you getting your money's worth of improvements if you go and buy a 675 LT? No, you're not. You're just not. It also is a car, when you drop down to lower speeds like this, maybe I'm spoiled, and I confess that is a definite possibility. I'm a lucky, lucky boy. Get to play with a lot of nice toys. But it really doesn't feel any different at all to the others. Now, when you're on that motorway, when you're driving along, yeah, sure, people will wave and smile at you, but they'll do that in a 12C. I think he needs to make the decision, and I'll let you know how that goes. If I said to him, no, don't do it, and he went and did it anyway, I think I'd forgive him. Anyway, a massive thank you to John for letting us come down and film a podium place, a lovely venue for petrol heads, and I hope to organise something there in the near future. To Anthony for coming out and being my assistant. I know it may look all glamorous, but trust me, when it comes to doing stuff like drive-bys with these, it's uh, a nerve-wracking business. And as ever, a huge thanks to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, because that's what makes this possible. And if you have subscribed already, do make sure you've checked the bell icon so you'll be notified of every new video release. And whatever it is, I hope to see you for the next one. Bye-bye.